Good morning and welcome to Malibu, California and the campus of Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. I'm Pete Peterson, the Dean here of the Graduate School and it's a pleasure to welcome you back for the fourth session in this second class as part of our Live from Malibu April Short Course series, The Roots of Capitalism versus Socialism with Dr. Gordon Lloyd, Professor Emeritus here of uh, the Graduate School of Public Policy. I doubt there are many on here who this is your first session, but if it is, we are using the Zoom platform uh, and this is intended to be uh, an interactive class, although the format for the session will be uh, beginning with Dr. Lloyd and about 45 minutes of lecture, and we'll reserve the last 15 minutes for your questions. Questions can be submitted through the chat box, which you can see on your screen at the bottom. You'll see a chat icon, and you should feel free throughout the class as a question rises in your mind, if you'd like to type that in. Uh, just please know that we'll be getting to those questions in the last 15 minutes of the session. Again, all of those who have registered for this session, and I believe our total registrations are in the neighborhood of 130 or 140 for uh, this particular class, will be getting a link to the recorded session afterwards uh, within 24 hours, as well as links to any of the books that Dr. Lloyd will be citing. Dr. Lloyd is, as I mentioned, our uh, Professor Emeritus, specifically our Doxon Professor Emeritus here at the School of Public Policy, a uh, longtime professor, and really in many ways, one of the founders of this unique graduate program. He is the co-author of uh, three books on the American founding and the sole author of a book on political economy of the New Deal. He writes widely, speaks widely on issues of political economy as well as the American founding. He has uh, co-authored a number of books with David Davenport, a former president of Pepperdine and professor at the School of Public Policy, including The New Deal and Modern American Conservatism, a defining rivalry uh, back in 2013. Uh, he has written a number of uh, edited volumes on the American founding. Uh, he is the creator uh, as well of an online uh, website exploring the American founding with the Ashbrook Center. This particular lecture uh, a series is a distillation of a beloved class here at the Policy School titled Political Economy. And it's also uh, taken from a co-authored book with Nicholas Capaldi on the subject of uh, political economy and, and the two competing visions of that. We've uh, been exploring up to this point and all the preceding sessions have been recorded uh, and are available on the website. Uh, looking first at the foundational debates uh, in the philosophy of economics between uh, John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, our second session looked at Adam Smith and uh, the origins of capitalism. Our session last week looked at uh, Karl Marx and Engels and of course uh, the Communist Manifesto and the philosophical foundations of uh, socialism and communism. And today, Dr. Lloyd will bring it all to a close with a discussion of how these competing ideas uh, um, find themselves in the American experience. And so I will stop my screen share without any further ado and welcome you here into LC 155 at the School of Public Policy and turn it over to you, Dr. Lloyd. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate it. And good afternoon for those of you who are on the East Coast. And good lunchtime for those of you who are in middle, middle America. And, I, and for the rest of us, it's still morning. Well, it's very difficult to 
sum up because this story never ends and one would mm. hope the story never ends one would hope that uh, unlike uh, there was a in the marx tradition and also in the hegelian tradition there's a notion of the end of history mm. which means an end of the story mm. and i would like to think that this question that we're looking at mm. the origins and then for the development and unfolding of the two arguments will probably be with us for a long time, because in many ways, that's that's the story um, of the last 300, 400 years. I don't see it going away. Very Although good. one might uh, be, particularly the Rousseau story, I think it's very, very strong in the academic world. Hmm. I think the Locke story is very strong in what we might call the working world. Hmm. And um, we need to, Take, and it manifests itself in universities in terms of the Rousseau story getting traction in humanities and sociology and psychology and the Locke traction getting like Locke getting traction in the law schools and in uh, business schools. Mm -hmm. And so I think the discussion is going to go on and the better we know the origins, yes, the deeper we're going to understand the variants because they're going to be variants and we've already seen that uh, Smith considers himself to have improved on Locke. Mm. And Marx and the other socialists think that they have improved on Rousseau. Mm. But they're still going back to those two origins of Locke and Rousseau will certainly help us deepen and enrich this argument. Mm. I want to start today then thinking that the Locke contribution is commerce. Mm. The Rousseau contribution is republicanism. Mm. And so we've got to deal with this phenomenon called the commercial republic. In and of itself, the two aspects do not necessarily automatically belong together. Mm. That the traditional understanding of republicanism was the public good, things of the public. And I think Rousseau is concerned that with the Locke narrative and the emergence of capitalism, you've got an, an interest in me mm. rather than we. Mm. And, and so you've got this notion of republicanism, which considers the collective good, or in Rousseau's term, the general will, as the phenomena to be aimed at and only to be moved away from with utter necessity. And therefore, there's going to be some kind of emphasis on equality. Mm. Not just equality of opportunity, but equality of outcome. That the general will uh, is not, it's not majority rule, but it's a coming together of the wills as if by an invisible hand. <laughs> That's been one of the great lessons, I think, of these first three sessions is that the, the critiques of capitalism, mostly from the left, criticize this idea of an invisible hand. But you've raised a very good point that the general will that is the foundation of uh, a, a left-leaning version of political economy also has in the general will this rather mysterious metaphysical understanding yeah. of, of how uh, decisions will be made policies will be set. Yes, and I think part of that is the difference between what Marx would call the soft socialists mm. who want to improve and produce a general good without smashing the system. And Marx's understanding is that you're still playing in the sandbox. Very good. And that it's still in the metaphysical or utopian realm. Mm. And what you need is science. And, the, and to explain how this uh, general will in the Marxist understanding comes to pass requires one to have a grasp of the dialectic. And so, so the dialectic itself is like an invisible hand. Very good, very good. <laughs> but it's not random. Yes. You know, it's not just- We know where this is going. Out. That's right, somehow nature or history or something out there knows how to pull this all together for the common good. So that's brilliant, right? I mean, that is brilliant. This, so 
so in some ways the dialectic this idea that we know where history is going that the moral arc of the universe is bending in a particular direction is in fact a, an understanding another way of seeing an invisible hand but but even more so it actually seems to predict if we have the right way of thinking about it where this is all heading yes and last time i mentioned that um, where it was heading was marin county <laughs> or, or or retirement <laughs> or our whole life is to pursue hobbies <laughs> and, and i just find that to be which means in other words that or some kind of automation yeah. has to be able to take over that's right all the all the drudgery that's right. that the division of labor comes with and we could be free of that that's right and it's it's a specialization well can i just pick up a question from sure. from last time that, that you raised do you think it was marx's i idea or belief that when the dialectic was realized and we were in this place that we were raising cattle in the morning and reading poetry at night and smoking cigars or whatever or raising bees and organic vegetables or whatever that this would have this would actually be the way everybody lived in a society or did he kind of understand you know what there's still going to have to be some people that are putting the well that's become that's who's going to make the pins right yeah there's going to be automation yeah i mean i can no, that's the only way i can come up with with an answer is that people aren't going to do that or or we make pins and then we go back to society and then other people in society will come and make pins and so we will have an exchange and nobody will be a pin maker <laughs> but they will know how to make pins <laughs> i think it's somehow the specialization of the division of labor which is really the alienated each and that that's where the more sort of the, the moral critique of capitalism comes in very good it's it's what capitalism does to people mm -hmm. and also we've got and, and i think i want to emphasize that although we went to marx because marx gives one of the i'd say the most acute critiques that i try to mention that there's there are softer critiques that do not attempt to overthrow. For example, right now, the Labour Party in Britain mm. has been, has been, the leadership has shifted, but there's no shift in the notion that when Labour comes back to power, they're going to, they're going to nationalize the railroads, nationalize this, that. So without somehow overturning uh, freedom of speech, mm -hmm. without overturning um, political parties and elections, right. And all the infrastructure, but they are going to go straight to the nationalization. Why? And the the answer in the socialist tradition is, it's too important to leave yeah. to the private interests yeah. of of individuals, and therefore, if society, and that's where socialism comes in. Right. So, if society owns the means of production, then we won't have these catastrophic. Uh, Swings, swings, etc. And so, one of the one of the interesting facts, questions for me is that, but then why do if you're going to take over the railroads, you're going to still have railroad unions? Why bother? Yeah, because part of the whole idea of encouraging the soft socialism, building unions and and a labor right. party was to protect the workers without overthrowing the system. Yeah, if it's if it's labor and management, this be, then the people become the management. So why do you need unions? Right. Very good. So that because, and, and that, by the way, is still an issue here in, in the United States. Yep. The unionization of federal employees. Very good. Which becomes an interesting mix of the two traditions. So we must be alert for there are softer versions than we've been through, and there are harsher versions. Mm. So how can we come up with a commercial society when both seem to be operating in opposite directions? Mm. And I think that's the challenge for us in this session, mm. to, look, to look through that, realizing that there are going to be uh, some twists and turns. Uh, and let's just begin, for example, with a question I often get and ask myself, does the Constitution of the United States require 
or encourage a certain kind of econ economics? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the answer is yes, with an asterisk. Very good. And the yes is, takes us right back to, to the first session we had, is that there is a, a little appreciated, I think, clause in Article 1, Section 8, which gives the 18 powers, the, lists the 18 powers of Congress, is that Congress has the authority to encourage the arts and useful sciences mm. by means of issuing patents for a limited time. Mm. For a limited time means no monopoly, no, no East India Company, no, no, no royal seal. Mm -hmm. The reason for a patent is to encourage you, and the limited is to discourage you from monopolizing. Very good. So that I think that clause suggests that we're going to have a commercial society or an entrepreneurial society encouraged by Congress. It doesn't say that Congress is going to own the means of production. Mm. It says that Congress is going to, are going to, is going to encourage Very good. the means of production in private hands. And I would say that that's commerce. Mm. And alongside that is an interstate commerce clause. Very good which suggests that what the Constitution is doing is trying to create a free trade area between the 13 original states. Because before the Constitution, a pint in Georgia was, may not be exactly the same as a pint, and I'm not talking about the quality of the beer, just yeah. about the, the size of the beer. But we are talking about beer. Just We're beer. talking about beer, because we could have to, after that, we've got beer, beef, bread, <laughs> that's right. So that, you have standardization. And in, in Britain, for example, the, the British pint of a drink is not the same thing as an American pint. Mm. And, and so you have these measures. Mm. And you can't really, and look how Britain had to change a lot of its, its, um, it, it, its, its measurement thing, like go, going to the metric system once it joined the European Union. Mm -hmm. And so I think in one area, the interstate commerce clause plus no coining of money at the local level, et cetera, is to try to create um, an extended yes. orbit. But isn't that interesting, Dr. Lloyd, that it was through economics and commerce that we move from the, the challenges of uh, the Articles of Confederation, where there was really this, these very states operating very, very loosely held together, that it was through the mechanism of com commerce and uh, uh, the, the interstate uh, clauses that you're talking about, that that was the way in which we understood ourselves, yes, as states, but also as a nation. And that, be, that no, I think that's correct. That is absolutely correct. And then, that, then you have the Rousseau challenge, mm -hmm. or the Montesquieu challenge. So what form of government are you going to have with this? Because you're no longer in a loose confederation mm. where each unit pretty much manages its own internal affairs and you only join together for war. Well, and to your point, even coining money, I think we forget that that was what was happening or at least discussed at the time. Yes. Yes. And so how can you have a trade if you're sort of living in Georgia and you have to go to to Massachusetts, you have to pass through several trade barriers mm. on the way and weights and measures and, and you know, all kinds of customs. So that you, part of the extending the commercial is introducing what I would say is that, so how do you keep, if, if that's what you want, mm. how are you going to keep the political from remaining constant? And that's what Britain had found, that once you join the economic part of the Union. Yes. How are you going to stop the political part of the union? Right. And so that becomes what the, the, the create the constitutional convention is all about. And what I mean by the Rousseau challenges and the Montesquieu challenges, history had taught that republics, in order to survive, must be small. Mm -hmm. You cannot have a republic over an extended period an extended area because you can't get the people together mm. in order to talk, deliberate, and find a general will. Mm. So there has to be some kind of small. Moreover, to encourage the general will, there must be some kind of homogeneity. There may be a common religion, a common dialect, something in common. 
in other words, an attachment mm. to localism mm. and all and all what that means in, in terms of localism. Well, if you're going to create an economic union among 13 separate, it's, you've raised the question. So how are you going to be able to retain those idea of a small republic in an extended territory? How do you do that? Very good. So I think part of the solution is to try to have republicanism at the national level to the extent that is possible. And each state then must become a republic because you cannot have a republic and a monarchy and a dictatorship in a confederate. You can't have it. Yeah. You're, you're just asking for trouble. Or the link that you cannot have it half free and half slave. Mm -hmm. That becomes the American issue. Yeah. Not monarchy and whatnot. Right. So I think if you look at the Constitution, it's an attempt to not only create an extended orbit for commerce, mm -hmm. but it is also an attempt to create republicanism on the largest scale that has ever been seen. Mm -hmm while retaining the notions of republicanism. So the way in which the commercial republic has developed in America is that the states have been left with what is known as police power over health and safety. Mm -hmm. You can still see that today. Yeah. And that the national government, or we don't even know what we call it, right? You could national government, federal government, general yeah. government, but so there's a sort of a confusion, is to do things for the general welfare and the common good and common defense, I mean, general welfare and common defense. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of the, and that, you, you, you buy that, and then the Bill of Rights comes in right, right there at the beginning because there are some people who, who are arguing, well, look, wait a minute, that general welfare and common defense clause, can, you could drive a truck through it. So why write things down? Americans write things down to feel secure. But once you write things down and you're dead, the next generation comes along and says, ooh, that looks nice. And they give it, they give you, so what oh, oh, about original intent? Well, they're dead. So then do we recover it? And, and, and on we go. So they come, but we have to at least reply to it. We have because absolutely, it's down. exactly, we have yes. to reply to it. Yes. So, that, um, so the Bill of Rights comes in in fact, to try to restrain Congress in its operation to those things that are laid down. And then you get the 10th Amendment, which says those things which are not laid down are reserved to the states or to the people. But then you have a, but then that provides a loophole because those who love the 10th Amendment forget it's for the people also. <laughs> it just says states' rights. So, I, the language is wonderful, and on we go, Very and good. on we go. Yeah. And I would think that, for example, one first battle of the commercial republic in America was the bank issue with Hamilton. Mm. And Hamilton claimed that Congress had the power to create a bank. Because, uh, and, and, and the opposition would say, well, where in that list of 18 do you see Congress has the power to bank? Well, you don't, but you can imply it. Mm. Well, that implicates, well, that's all, where do we stop this implication? Well, it's a reasonable interpretation and it's an unreasonable. Well, what's the reasonable? That it is necessary and proper to conduct commerce that we have a central bank. Mm. Well, you, and so we get this notion that commerce then requires some infrastructure or support. And that becomes then is how far do you go? That is, does it have to be completely free market mm. or is there a room for government consistent with a market structure? Mm. And by the time you get to Jackson, Jackson sees the banks are controlled by the few who are rich to, to muck the rest of us mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. And so he refuses to, to charter. To, to, to charter. Yeah. And, uh, and then we've got a lot of court cases, which is where you don't have in Britain and you don't have it through Europe. A lot of these cases over commerce and republicanism and the states and the nation are taken to court. Mm -hmm. so you have the slaughterhouse cases. Right. And, and, and then you have the Lochner case mm -hmm. in, in the 1890s. Mm -hmm. and to what extent can states pass minimum wage laws? To mm -hmm. what extent that? Then you get the 1930s with the New Deal. 
right. and a, a sort of a switch. So a lot of this is not just linked mm. between commerce and politics, but you have, because we're because of the Constitution, we bring the judges. Yep. Uh, so that the American situation is very complicated, but driven by these questions of political economy. It really that is. That is correct. Yeah. That is correct. And I want to make a distinction between what we might call political economy and social economy. Very good. Okay. Political economy, what I was first, when we first talking about, meant that the economic question, what shall we eat? What should we do? What should we do? Such and such, comes out of the household mm -hmm. and goes into the public arena. It goes into the political sphere. Mm -hmm. So it becomes the economic question becomes political. Mm. Because it becomes political, it doesn't mean that the politicians make the decision. It just goes political. Right. Yes, it goes public. Right. Social question is what the socialists are interested in. Mm. And a social question is, well, what happens to the rest of society when the few become the, now the capitalist replacements for the monarch and the, and the aristocracy? They start running the show. What about the rest of us? We see poor housing. We see people on the streets. Yeah. What about the rest of society? Yeah. And so the soft socialists would say, well, let's set up cooperatives. Mm -hmm. Let's set up an, a, a, a utopian idea like the Fabians. And we have schools and we have experimental things. Yeah. Or the other one would be a little harder saying, well, Let's create unions. Mm -hmm. So there's pushback. Mm -hmm. So that we have a union competition. If you like competition, we'll give you some. Mm -hmm. Right? And, um, and Adam Smith, and one of the ironies is that Adam Smith you know, should never, somehow merchants aren't really interested in competition. They're interested in market share. Mm -hmm. That's my language, not Smith's. Yeah. So that they're not really interested in competition. They're really interested in monopoly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And kind of carving out something for themselves and cutting you out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, so I would think that the social question is raised particularly by the time the 1880s come around in Europe and in America. Mm -hmm. That the, the communists are, in fact, in my opinion, quelled. Mm -hmm. That in 1848, you've got all of that stuff. And in the 1880s, it's now more managerial. So you get Woodrow Wilson and the administrative state. Which we you just get, covered. Last and you get session. Engels saying that the state will wither away. To be replaced by? An administration. Yes. All, all administrators, entrepreneurs are gone. You've got in the 1930s, 1932, uh, FDR's Commonwealth Club speech, a must for all public policies. We'll send a link. We'll send a link. The Commonwealth after. Club speech. Yeah. Um, and where he, he, he provides the history of America for the 19th century and buys into the frontier thesis, which is America was once individualistic yeah. and we conquered the frontier, et cetera, et cetera. But now the, th those, days, those days are over. We're now in the industrial age, such, such as that. And, Therefore, we have to do something with the problem that we have instead of stop dreaming. Mm -hmm. And so he declares the age of the entrepreneur is over. We have now the arrival of the enlightened administrator. Yes. And so, again, the issue is that means that basically the production issue has been solved, but all we're interested in distribution. But the Great Depression and the New Deal is all about creating production. Mm. But so you've got this clash in the New Deal between government increasing production by hiring people to work and then the distribution problem is that we have to look out for the forgotten man. Yeah. Production and distribution. And that really, that's very important. Yeah. Uh, and what is also fascinating is that in 1848, when you've got the Communist Manifesto coming out of Europe and making the hard case for socialism, mm -hmm. You've got people like John Stuart Mill and Sumner and, uh, and Spencer, Herbert Spencer, and around about the same time, making what I would call the hard case for capitalism. Mm -hmm. The hard case for capitalism is the introduction of the phrase laissez-faire, mm -hmm. which Smith does not use. 
it basically comes through this conversation. And what is laissez-faire? It's a French term, mm -hmm. which means to let be. And it, 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 in terms of our conversation, it means let the people be to make their own decisions concerning food, shelter, clothing, beef, beer, and yeah. bread. Yeah. They, we can figure that one out. And with that would come, laissez-faire meant a minimum state doing basic objectives. And laissez-faire had a strong following in, 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 in Britain. And that's, so you got laissez-faire becoming the capitalist side, the hard capitalist side in terms of arguments. Mm -hmm. And you have communism being the hard yeah. socialist side. And you got two Darwinists at work. Yes, you do. Boy, it, this is a great point. Because the Sumner Spencer yes. thing yes. is that um, <clears throat> Spencer wrote a piece called Man Versus the State, and in which he makes the argument that the state doesn't really know what it's doing. People don't know. There's no such thing as an enlightened administrator. There's no all those kinds of and that comes right out of Adam Smith. Mm -hmm. But what he got, what he then poses as, as, as a case for letting things alone mm -hmm. is a doctrine of the survival of the fit, mm -hmm. which means that the way evolution works is that those who work hard get it, those who don't work hard don't deserve it. Yes. And so it's, it's, a, it's a species argument um, applied to human beings. Yes. So that by the time you get to the 1880s, the case for capitalism has provided its own hard case for opponents to hit it. Right. That you mean laissez-faire becomes do nothing from the government. Right. But it tracks with Darwin in that. Yes, correct. It tracks the, the, with Darwin. This is, this is Darwinian, as much as we have a Darwinian understanding of, of human evolution, then a, a radical capitalist laissez-faire system really does track in accord with our nature, so to speak. Yes. Yes. And then you've got the, you've got the, the sort of the hard socialist right. uh, Darwinian notion of the evolution of regimes. Yes. Uh, and, it's, and the survival of the fittest is going to be that capitalism won't survive. Yes. And something will replace it. It will have the best features of feudalism. We're all nice and warm together. Closeness. Mm -hmm. But it will not have the poverty of feudalism. Mm -hmm. We'll have capitalism, the richness of capitalism, yeah. without the alienation. Yeah. So the promised land is uh, friendship with plenty. So isn't it important, again, just to draw back to one of the earlier, the, our, our first class here, that we are having very much of a human nature debate, right? Yeah. It, it, and I, I wish I knew or could remember, there's a great book on Hitler versus Stalin. Mm -hmm. And at one point in the description, uh, the historian was making the case that, that Hitler was, was taking a very Spencerian notion of human evolution that it was purely genetic, while, the, mm -hmm. while, the, while Stalin and the communists were taking a very much of a, a, a nurture societal understanding of human evolution. So it was a nature versus nurture debate, but it was nonetheless very much of a, uh, a, an understanding of how human nature was, was formed and, and evolved. Yes, and my, one of my problems with that thesis is that there's very little nurturing in Stalin. <laughs> a heck of a lot of killing. There's a hell of a lot of gulag. But, but isn't that the case, right? I mean, that if you're going to follow that, that view of human nature, that is that we are, we, there really isn't a genetic nature to our evolution that is purely nurture, then you're gonna force a lot of people through these so-called nurturing institutions where if they resist, there's gonna have to be bloodletting. Well, we'll give them a chance to, con to, to... We're gonna have to crack a few eggs, in other words, we'll, to we'll borrow a phrase. We'll crack a few eggs, we'll, get, we'll give them the chance to repent. That's right. We'll Not in the church. What's that? Not in the church. Not in the church, no, in the church of Stalin. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so the whole idea of what a church does changes. Yes. 
it, it, it sort of fulfills the society, not the individual. So this, this discussion about social economy and political economy, I think is, is a fascinating one as it pertains to the American experience. Um, and, and this understanding as well of, of human nature that the founders had and an understanding that there was going to, so to your point about tying together, is the constitution a uh, presuppose a certain type of economic system? Yes. Almost begs the question for today, and I don't, we don't have to go too far into this, but do other types of political systems, can they still support a commercial, system. I don't even want to call it a commercial republic, but of course I'm thinking about China now. Yeah, well, you see that, well that's very, yeah. I, China is an attempt, it seems to me, to defy the story. Very good. That you can have commerce without republicanism. Very good. Or you have the People's Republic. Yes. Which changes the whole nation of republicanism. They don't have, that the general will now comes through the party. Yes. You don't need to gather. And, oh, the gathering is only to get your opinion so that you can conform. Yes. And we can, we can, we can find out who's not yeah, going we can find out. We could, we could do that very easily. Social science. I mean, American universities will sell that to us. This is good. This is good. Uh, I, well, I would say that part of the reason why maybe other countries don't apply constitutionalism this way is that they don't have the, the, the written, the attachment to the written document, which, which you pointed out, that, we, that you have to appeal to it or you have to answer it. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the first battle is over the powers of Congress mm -hmm. and the Tenth Amendment, both constitutional arguments. And I would suggest that by the time you get to the New Deal, which, which, by the way, in 1937, you've got the 150th anniversary of the, of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the country is collapsing. Mm. And I find it virtually impossible to read FDR's speeches and the whole politics of the New Deal without understanding that the Constitution is not just lurking, mm. but we have... a, a an issue over the constitutionalism of what the New Deal programs are all about. Mm -hmm. And uh, you got <clears throat> FDR appealing to the framers. Mm. And the most important part of the constitution becomes we the people mm. and general welfare. And that therefore justifies mm. pretty much the New Deal and the welfare state. So you mentioned before that when we get into the 1880s and 1890s, that the movement towards communism seems to be somewhat moderated mm -hmm. around the world. Mm -hmm. But of course we get in now into the 19 teens with World War I, of course, mm -hmm. and it, it does it reawaken in the Russian context or what what is the what is the importance of that period between the 1880s and 90s and that it reawakens seemingly to become institutionalized in a nation state system? well uh, that's a very good question and, and we don't have a long time to answer that deep question but what i will say is briefly in response to this that somehow the Russians, the Soviets, Lenin, Stalin, and the, and the Chinese with Mao figured you could st skip a stage. Hmm. That instead of going from the sickle to the hammer and then the hammer and the sickle, mm -hmm. you could go from the sickle to the hammer. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and the hammer will be not getting rid of the capitalists because we won't have whatever we all we don't have we can skip a stage mm. and that becomes an interesting question whether you can skip a stage 
or as Marx said, you have to have capitalism before you can have socialism. Yeah. And so how can you skip capitalism and still call yourself socialist? Which you did not really have in Russia. That is correct. Hmm. So, I mean, that's a brief answer to your yes, question, the super good. stage. The other thing is that, is that the intellectuals, I think in Western Europe, gave up on liberalism in the 1880s and 1890s. If you ask, which I have, I, in, in sort of textually, ask Hayek, in his road to serfdom. He says, we're, we're on the road to serfdom. Obviously, he doesn't like it. We want to be on the road to freedom. Mm -hmm. So my question to Hayek has been, well, when did, this, when did this road to serfdom start? And his answer, basically, it is a Western uh, lack of, of devotion, um, a lack of Western intellectual devotion to liberal democracy is limited government and free enterprise mm -hmm. and they gave up on it and moved to and started moving towards socialism they weren't particularly interested in communism they were interested in socialism and so the road to the road to serfdom started in the 1880s says hayek with the abandonment of what we might call western values mm. in the intellect so it's an intellectual problem and his writing is actually to, to British socialists saying, beware. Uh, now you're coming to the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. Beware that you don't go on a road to serfdom. And of course, what happened is that, is, is that they introduced the welfare state, they introduced all of that. But in that process with Hayek and then Friedman, capitalism and freedom, he makes the case. So that, even though the intellectual world seems to have moved against the Western values, it hasn't moved too much towards Russia. I mean, mm. it's sympathetic. Yes. Sympathetic to Russia because it's egalitarian. Supposedly. Supposedly egalitarian. Yeah. So it doesn't matter that we're equal in poverty. <laughs> we're egalitarian, as Tokyo says it. You know, they exchange. <laughs> This is it's equality. And uh, so, so I'm frequent would say that the turning point for him is a bit later. Mm. The, the, the bit later is the great society yes. emerging. And, uh, and, and so his case is against the great society. I think Hoover's case was against the New Deal. Yes. By the time the New Deal comes along, laissez faire has a bad name. Yes. Uh, individualism has a bad name. The person who used the phrase rugged individualism was Hoover. He invented it. Yeah. And he invented it after World War I to explain what was different about America than Europe. That in Europe, response to this question, though, about whether wither socialism exactly, here in the United States. Exactly. Very good. And he presents the idea that America are full of rugged individuals and sex. He doesn't mean laissez-faire. He doesn't mean all of it, but it's, it becomes an obvious ban. <clears throat> You're just interested in individualism. Yes. And part of the problem today, it seems to me, with this social distancing, is that you're encouraging individualism. And if individualism is the problem. How's that working out? How's that going to work <laughs> out? Right? I mean, you, the, the, the ironies of all of this. Yeah. And the great society is built on the premise that we have enough production. Yeah. We are a rich society, but not a great society. Yeah. We must be able to take care of this, 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 this. And then you ask, well, where is it, where is LBJ getting a constitutionalism for this? Yeah. FDR got it from the general welfare clause yeah. and we the people. Yeah. Progressives get it from we the people. Right. And, but where does, where does LBJ get it from? Right. 14th Amendment, equal protection. Mm. And so now you've got the courts involved in the process as well. FDR used to get really mad. He gave a lecture on what the, on what the, the whole idea of good government is. He said, you've got Congress, which is a horse. You've got the president, which is a horse. We're carrying the carriage and the American people are in it. That's what the New Deal is about. Problem is the, the judiciary, the horse is backwards. 
And what we have to do is to change the judiciary so we have three horses yeah. carrying the chariot in the same way yeah. for we the people. Yeah. Interesting about the great society, you've got the three horses working together. Yes. And were the people in the carriage supposedly, did they have reins in their hands or were oh, they just yeah. being left That was the boat. Mandate. Right. They gave a mandate. They had, a, they had the whip whip. And they say, every four years, bam, yeah. here's the whip. And if you want a little slash, do it every two years and make sure that we, we're going in the right direction. So like, the whole idea of what a commercial republic is supposed to be yeah. changes is, I mean, Congress is now the attachment to the president. The Supreme Court is supposed to guide what the mores are. Right. And whatever happens is federalism and states' rights. Mm. So do you buy the argument that some have put forth that at the time of the Depression and the New Deal, when, when our political economy and, and those kinds of uh, perceptions and systems were under such withering attack globally, much less in the United States, that Roosevelt's proposals within the New Deal were in a way to temper the prospects of going full socialism in the United States. I think there's that, I, yes. <clears throat> I, uh, that as far left as Roosevelt went, yes. to keep it within context, he was responding to those, even within, within his own administration, right. who wanted to go so much further. They did want to go fair? so much further, and I, and I think that then the, 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 the tradition of reading the Declaration, the tradition, even though it's pushed in, in terms of the Constitution, I think that there's that, and Roosevelt kept getting criticism. Mm. So it's not just from the left, he's getting criticism from the right. And although today Hoover is hardly looked at, he's looked upon as a fool for, for the regard to the economy, he, unlike any previous president, and unlike any subsequent president, spent five years after he left office yes. criticizing Roosevelt, writing extensively. We'll send a link to this book. So what, what is the, the Two Faces of Two faces of liberalism. liberalism, which is another great book. We'll send the link. But this debate between Hoover and Roosevelt, and Roosevelt. Right. <coughs> lays, lays out, it seems to me, how far on the one hand you can go and keep a commercial republic. FDR and how and you've got this criticism which is going on and, and it starts catching the criticism starts catching by 1938 now you say that's a long time but, but that Roosevelt loses the Congress in 1938 mm. people forget that so so you've got six years of, of, of this building and the course of stopping Roosevelt yes and his own administration is, is wondering how far they can go and um, and Roosevelt in 1937 gave a speech, and you got to read this. You're going to say, "Oh, wait a minute! Is he really pulling one over on us?" He's, he makes the case for free enterprise. Roosevelt, yes, and how he is saving free enterprise. And so you have Hoover saying he's, he's saving free enterprise. You have Roosevelt saying <laughs> he's saving free enterprise. Where's the debate? Where's the debate? <laughs> right? And, and Hoover is saying. This is not a this is not a, a a competition between two personalities. It's a question between two philosophies. Very good. And uh, you know, it's uh, the forgotten man thesis is a is, a, is fascinating because mm. originally it was Sumner in the 1840s 1850s who introduced this notion that the forgotten man is where a the left-wing thinker, hmm. persuades B, the parliamentarian, to tax C, hmm. us, yes. to enhance D, the down and out. Hmm. And so who is the forgotten man in this story? The voter, C. Very good. When it comes to Roosevelt, he frames his issue in terms of the forgotten man. But the forgotten man in Roosevelt is the marginalized man. Is D. Is, yes, that's right, is D. 
And so the whole idea is one third of the people is that's like one third of where we have to have everyone, everyone. And then, and then you get to uh, LBJ and he admits that it's no, it's no longer really one third, it's one fifth. But we can't be a great society unless we take care of the one fifth. It's an embarrassment, it's an injustice. Yes. That we have to take care of this one fifth. So he continues the forgotten man, which then becomes the marginalized man. Mm. Under Roosevelt, the forgotten man is D, the down and out work, et cetera, in the bread line. The forgotten man in LBJ's great society is really uh, the African American. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so on that note, tie, tie this back then to Marx. And I wanna, I wanna okay. connect up. So the forgotten man in Marx would be one that he, he presumed in the great dialectic that this was what was going to happen with capitalism. There were yeah. going to be millions of forgotten men and women would he put them into the proletariat yeah. category yeah and that uh, they will finally realize that they have nothing to lose but their chains mm. and they will rise up and they will take over mm. so it's not that they have to be fed see that's soft socialism mm. we feed them marx is you take over yeah and and in his communist manifesto everyone shall work yeah. And the person who he thinks doesn't work is the capitalist. Yeah. So everyone is going to work. But the work is not going to be division of labor. It's not going to be yeah. labor. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be pleasure. Yeah. Because production, the question of production has been set. So I think that's it, that it comes, keeps coming back to that. Yeah. 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 And I, uh, and, and, and so when we're facing, we're facing this issue now, when are we going to go back to work? Yes. Well, this, this brings up another point. We're starting to get some questions here. Sure. We're, we're in our last, we're, we're going to run at least five minutes late. I'll just warn the class. Um, the difference in the American context versus uh, Marx, which was stateless, obviously, when Marx was conceiving of this. He did not have a nation state that had taken this on. But just what the value of work is. Now, in the American context, it would seem to me that the founders understood that work not only had its essential role in a commercial republic, but there was something about work in and of itself, especially when you look at the many of the founders who were themselves businessmen of one stripe or another, um, that Marx doesn't seem to have a very favorable understanding of, of work. Is that, is that fair or is, or is it maybe the type of work that Marx is seeing around him, just such drudgery? That, that very, yeah, yeah, no, that's very important. <clears throat> And I mentioned last time that it was really Engels in many ways yeah. who radicalized Marx. Mm. Anybody who was anybody on the left went to Paris in the 1840s, full of songs, full of cool talk, full of getting this done. And so they met in Paris. Yeah. And Marx, I think, was a dreamer in part. So his idea of the German ideology and his fishing in the morning, doing yeah. such and such. <clears throat> was done in 1845. By the time 1848 had come along, I think Engels had shown him a had shown him his book, which was called The Condition of the Working Class. Mm. And mm. He focused on England. And Engels ran a manufacturing place. Mm. And so he wrote this book. And we often think of Dickens in talking about very good on the streets and yes. this, that, 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 the other. But Engels also, with, with a harsher tone, it's not, and so that becomes, I think, the framework for the, for the collaboration between Marx and Engels, the condition of the working class. Mm. And that <clears throat> Adam Smith had made the argument 
that the, in the wealth of nations, that by letting people be and work, the condition of the working class will rise. Mm. Certain individual, unfortunately, it'll happen with the, with the harshness of this division of labor, but the whole nation will be lifted up and we can solve the problems. Right. Um, by the time you get to John Stuart Mill, it's this, and Tocqueville and Mill, 1830s, 1840s, you get this notion of the, the rise of communism, the rise of a strong egalitarian, a strong critique, appealing to the, to the masses. That's where you get the whole idea. Of the individual is replaced by the mass. Mm. There's no individualism, or whatever it is. It's just among the people who, who are trying to control you. And so, so John Stuart Mill says, the people will resist this. Tocqueville is, prob is, is a problem, whether the people will resist this. And what Tocqueville is talking about is, is the nanny state. He's not talking about it, the communist state, right? That's right. He's looking at that soft socialism is coming. Yes. And, peop and people are going to buy into it. Mill is talking about soft socialism also. And can I, it had nothing to, what, nothing to do with the hard socialism, communism. Tocqueville doesn't want, he doesn't even think that's coming in terms of the yes. temptation. Yes. And Miller answers Tocqueville in a sense and says in his, in his political economy. By the way, Mill's political economy, which not often read, but we read it, read it in the class, yeah. is 1848. Mm. The same year as same. Marx. So you could get, so Mill says once, once, uh, the, the individual has tasted the uh, benefits of work and labor and now is raising themselves up mm -hmm. and no longer part of a mass or, or potential part of a mass. They will never give that up. So for Mills, his book again, on liberty, liberty is that people are attached to liberty. Mm. Whereas Tocqueville's point is that people are attached to equality. And so when Miller says people are attached to liberty, he sees a potential continuation yeah. of the commercial republic if you let people alone to make their own decisions and you limit government in terms of welfare to provide for those who are down and out, but you don't provide them in such a way that become so comfortable to be down and out. Yes. So that you offer them some incentives so that that would be Mill's commercial republic answer to what do you do with the down and out and the forgotten man? And, and, right, you give them help, you provide them with the tools yes. to be able to take care of themselves. So there is that morality right, the of self-reliance is important in human nature and that nature itself provides instinctively within, because it's nature, yep. for self-preservation. Whereas Tocqueville says in his latter chapters, which are quite prophetic in some ways, that as people rise up through this capitalist system, they will, they will almost inherently seek to protect themselves and ask for government to do yes. that protecting. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and Mill would try to resist that. Yeah, he would try to nurture the idea of you talk nurturing. We try to nurture that which nature gives us instinctively. Yes, which is self reliance. Yeah, and uh, and encourage it, and that means a growing economy. Yeah, it doesn't mean that your emphasis is going to be on equity or whatnot. It's going to be on liberty. Mm. But once you emphasize liberty, then, then the equality uh, uh, concept follows. It mm. doesn't lead. But once you're interested in the social question, mm. you're not interested in individual liberty anymore. You're interested in the social good. And so equality and equity become the driving uh, moral concerns and any deviation from equity has to be explained. Yes. Whereas I think with the Smith Mill model, is any deviation from liberty mm. has to be explained. Yeah. And within those two models, you have a different role for government. 
Mm. Well, we are just about at our time. Uh, we have, a, 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 I think, an important question here about the view of the Constitution. And this, this certainly was the case of the New Deal. Um, about, and, and certainly just referring back to the preceding class here with, with Dr. McClay, talking about the Constitution as a living, breathing yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, this certainly comes into play when we're having these questions about political economy at the time of the Depression and yeah. the New Deal. Yes where the Constitution, as much as it was written down, in some ways was seen as, dare I say, irrelevant to the challenges of modern times. And so could you talk a little bit, maybe, and this, I, this might be a, a great way to conclude the session, about even, and I don't think I thought about this in ways until this conversation here, that it's really these questions of political economy that are driving this understanding of the American founding and the Constitution. Um, that the relevance of the Constitution in times of crisis. Well, it, it, uh, I think that's very, very important. And I've pondered that for a long time. And some of my friends indicate that there is inherent power. And the inherent power is lodged in the executive. And they're trying to suggest that since the founders followed Locke, which they did in many ways, mm -hmm. Locke provides mm -hmm. in his second treatise that when emergency comes, that laws can be made that haven't been made with the, by the consent of the government for emergency purposes. But then when the emergency is over, it returns to that. that. And, and Locke, Locke said this. Yes, okay. Locke said that. There is nothing that I have found in the founding that says that. Mm. So there's no way, it seems to me, that one could suspend elections. Come rain, come shine, come war, come peace. Every two years you have a congressional election. Every four years you have a presidential election. We have never postponed that. Yeah. Okay. Um, now we've fiddled with how the vote is going to be taken. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of fiddling going on there. And, and I don't mean under, underhanded. I mean, do you have to vote by mail? Do you have to yeah. vote in person? Do you have to put your hands up? Do you have to do whatever? But as far as I know, there is no inherent. So it's all interpretive. Mm. And who's to decide what an emergency is? I think that the turning point is twofold. One with Woodrow Wilson mm. and the progressive movement, which sees that the purpose of politics is action. The purpose of politics is not to sit around and chat, it's to do things. So that idea of, well, what are you doing? And by that, by that you were talking government. Yes. What are you doing? The, heirs, the era of laissez-faire is over. Now it's the time to do something. And that means, according to Wilson and other progressives, that power to do something is not going to be lodged in the executive. So you have a turning away from Congress. You have a case, you have, in fact, a case against Congress being made. A part of, of, of that case is that they slow things down and they get in the way, they do such and such and such and such. Or, or that's point number one. Hmm. Point number two would be that Roosevelt, FDR, declared that this is an emergency. And he went to Congress and said, in his, um, in his state, uh, his inaugural address, that, you know what? I think that under the Constitution, we have enough power to handle this emergency, mm. okay? But if we don't have enough power to handle this emergency, I'm gonna ask Congress for emergency powers because what we're doing here is the equivalent of war. Mm. So I want war powers. At least FDR didn't assume. Yeah, that they were already there. Yeah, yeah inherent. He yeah. had to ask Congress for it, mm. right? I mean, you might say that's just pro forma, he had the votes, he did such and such. But the language of the importance of the Constitution, which is what you're getting at, yes, right, re just even pro requires him 
to have at least the rhetoric and decency to say, I'm going to ask Congress for the war power. But then, of course, he went on and issued a whole bunch of emergency recommendations. So I think the first one is the idea that we're in a, we're in a new era as the progressives. Power must now shift to the, the, the old system of the founders was, was, was a pertinent for the 18th century, yes. but now we're living in the late 19th century. We need a new form of government, and that's going to be the administrative state. Yes. And then you get to Roosevelt, which is, we're in the war. And he says, it, but the memorable phrase, and David Davenport and I worked on this, the memorable yes. phrase from the first, is, from his the inaugural address is all we have to fear is fear itself. That's what we remember. Yes. But the most important phrase is what the people want is action and action now. So you become an action yes. government. Mm -hmm. And then once you unleash the idea of an action government, the question is how do you restrain the government to action which you've justified as proper under the constitutional Congress has granted you the powers, which, which the Supreme Court declares that you don't have. Yes, very good. And so then you, that has to, to sort of unravel or, 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 or make sense. Um, and, um, John LBJ has absolutely no hesitation in saying we're going to have a war on poverty. Yeah. So politics becomes war, as, yes. as David and I have argued. And we'll send a link to that excellent book, your recent book on that, um, because it, it obviates deliberation. Yes. It obviates disagreement, which if there is a founding principle, it is the, it is the centrality of deliberation in making decisions for the public. That's correct. That's right. Deliber and I, I would say that if you ask Madison, what is the key definition of a republic? It's the, uh, the attempt to capture the deliberate sense of the, the community. community. It's not the general will, it's yes. the deliberate sense. And so the deliberate sense is like you have a two year election mm -hmm. and you have a four year election, you have local elections, you have a chance to sleep on it, you have a chance to talk with your neighbor, people talk so that a deliberate sense based on reasoning, mm -hmm. based on persuasion, mm -hmm. right? It's not just willing it into being. Yes. It is talking it into being. Yes. So you're giving consent. Yes. Uh, and I think that's what he what he would mean by by the opera for republic. Does a commercial aspect uh, uh, undermine that? Yes. And I think his answer is no. It extends the orbit, just as Adam Smith thought that you could uh, increase the wealth well-being of a nation by increasing its wealth. We increase its wealth by productivity or division of labor. And the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. Yeah. Madison's point is that Growth you cannot do away with faction. That's the, that's the, uh, that's the Rousseau, yeah. Marx model of doing away with faction. Yes. He says we cannot do away with faction because if we do, we get rid of liberty. Yes. So if we want to- Of course you do, right? Yeah. Because I know what the general will is. And the fact that you're disagreeing with me means that you are disagreeing now with the general will. Yeah, and you, the only thing that you can do is to say, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm wrong. Yeah. And apologize. Yeah, that's and right. There is, no, there is no resort under the general will in the end to an individual conscious opinion. Yes. Well, Dr. Lloyd, this has been just an amazing, the, the questions we're getting now about is uh, if, if we can extend these into May. And we are having those uh, conversations, I'll just say. Uh, this is the last planned session for uh, this series. And uh, I'm seeing so many familiar names and faces on the screen. I know that uh, many of you have uh, enjoyed this as much as I have. I've told Dr. Lloyd off camera, if you will, that if, if this camera was not plugged into anything, I would be the most uh, uh, benefited, grateful person in the world just to spend these last four weeks with you, Dr. Lloyd. It's been such a pleasure. You wouldn't say that if you didn't mean it. <laughs> I don't know. Because you're a dean. <laughs> <laughs>
well. Well, we are going to bring uh, this session to a close. Again, we're going to send you all the, the links to the books described, some of which uh, Dr. Lloyd has either written or co-written. And of course, uh, also a link to this recorded session that you should feel free to share with your networks. Um, just really such important questions uh, that are, are so relevant to today. And uh, should we uh, schedule either a new series or individual sessions with, with Dr. Lloyd, we will certainly let you all know. I wanna thank you for your time spending it with us. Um, we, we do have one more session left for today, which is uh, Dr. Bob Kaufman is going to be starting in about 20 minutes, his uh, series on foreign policy and uh, grand strategy. And so if you are going to join us for that, you need to click on the specific Zoom link for that that should be on your calendar or in your email. Otherwise, please uh, take care, God bless, and uh, I know we'll stay in touch. Thank you, goodbye.